In both prokaryotes and eukaryotes, most cell division involves the distribution of identical genetic material, DNA, to two daughter cells. The exception, of course, is meiosis, which is a special type of eukaryotic cell division that can produce sperm and eggs. What is remarkable is the fidelity with which DNA is passed along. A cell's genetic information, its genome, is that package. And for bacteria, it is a single long DNA molecule, wherein in eukaryotes, it's a number of DNA molecules. Overall, we consider the DNA that is packaged to be a chromosome. Every eukaryotic chromosome consists of one long linear DNA molecule associated with many proteins, together referred to as chromatin. A chromosome is packaged and organized structure containing most of the DNA, and you see that sort of relationship. So when you look at things like mitosis, what's going to happen is that the chromosome, which exists as a single chromatid per chromosome, will duplicate and will produce what's called sister chromatids. However, that sister chromatid is still considered one chromosome after replication. It's just now a double-stranded chromosome. Once the cells divide again at the end of mitosis, you are back to one single-stranded chromosome, but it is still a single chromosome. So while you are looking at this chromatin structure, we need to realize that mitosis is a non-reductive process. So while the amount of DNA goes up, the number of chromosomes is not altered. The evolutionary progression of mitosis really evolved from binary fission in bacteria. So if you look at the example here, you have the DNA. It's not really organized. You have that nucleoid. You're going to have the origin of replication, which is where the two copies are going to begin to duplicate. That will then keep going until one copy of the origin is now at each end of the cell, and the cell will finish the replication and then divide into two. So it's binary fission. Okay, if you look at other forms of life outside of the mammal structure, we can see like in dinoflagellites, we have a nucleus now and microtubules are involved and the chromosomes are moving separately. And that gets much more like what we think of as mitosis when you move on to something like a diatom or some of the yeasts with this actual intact nuclear envelope and the kinetochores. All of this is going to, you can see sort of the evolutionary steps that led to mitosis. Overall, though, you have the cell cycle. The cell cycle is primarily interphase, which is divided into G1, S, and G2. During G1, or gap 1, the cell is going to grow and then synthesize proteins. During the S phase, chromosomes will replicate and divide to form sister chromatids. And during the G2 phase, the cells will continue and grow and prep for cell division. We call these phases the gap phases because you can't see anything going on with the light microscope. So we didn't know anything was happening. We know now that these gap phases we more correctly referred to as growth phases, uh, but the name stuck. The actual mitotic phase is the division process. Mitosis is the division of the nucleus and cytokinesis is the division of everything else. So G0 is gonna be a non-dividing state. Some cells are going to leave this division process and never divide again. Uh, something like a nerve cell or a muscle cell will go into G0 for the extent of their life. Some cells will be able to enter and leave G0 as needed, and that's going to be something like the liver, which is what allows the liver to regenerate. Now, you're going to be expected to know the phases and what occurs at each of the phases for mitosis. So during interphase, at the end of interphase, you have duplicated double-stranded chromosomes uh, but that's really about it. Everything else is present. What's going to happen at the end of interphase is that the centrosomes are then going to begin to do their job. Really, there's going to be a cascade of chemical signals that are occurring, and we'll look in more detail at those chemical signals later. But prophase is going to be the first real phase of mitosis. The mitotic spindle begins to form from the asters, of microtubules made by the centrosomes. The centromeres will structure, the chromosome structure will form. The nucleolus has disappeared because that was just chromatin, now it's condensed. Uh, and then other structures like the nuclear membrane will begin to break down. Prometaphase, the nuclear membrane is basically gone now, you just have fragments. But the thing that really separates the prometaphase is that the microtubules 
will connect. They will either connect to the centromeres and form what's now called the kinetic core or the movement center, or they'll connect with non-kinetic core microtubules and begin to push against each other, uh, allowing it to sense locations and structures within the cell. In the metaphase, the motor proteins in the kinetic cores will move the chromosomes to the middle or the metaphase plate, and it's going to know where the middle is because of those non-kinetic core microtubules pushing against each other. So metaphase is unique because it's where they're all arranged in the middle. At that point, you will then begin to uh, do the division process. But how are these things really moving around? It comes down to the mitotic spindle. So the chromosomes are connected to microtubules at the centromere kinetic core. And really the question was, is it that they're moving from the end of the kinetic core and sort of reeling them in, or is it that the, the actual spindle is getting shorter and moving them along? So they put radioactive markers on these spindles and they determined eventually that what's happening is that the spindle is being shortened. Uh, the tubulin subunits are being removed as the motor protein walks along. So the path is basically essentially disappearing behind the movement of the mitotic spindle. During anaphase, the area of overlap is reduced as the protoproteins attached to the microtubules walk them away using energy from ATP. So as the microtubules push apart, the, they lengthen the addition of new tubular monomers to their overlapping ends, allowing continued overlap, but the ones that are carrying the chromosomes are moving shorter and shorter, and so it's going to be moving back and forth, allowing these motor proteins to walk these chromosomes along again, powered by ATP. During anaphase, the proteins that hold the centromere together will be divided and the chromosomes will begin to move towards the opposite poles. You'll also notice that those non-kinetic core ones are pushing against each other and elongating the cell, uh, expanding that central space. In telophase, telophase is essentially the reverse of prophase. So the nucleolus is coming back, the chromosomes are decondensing, the spindle is breaking down, okay? cytokinesis, you're then going to be dividing the cytoplasm and all of the other organelles. What that looks like is different if you're in a plant or an animal cell, but cytokinesis is the division of the cytoplasm and is not technically part of mitosis, even though it is part of this non-interphase component of division. In animal cytokinesis, you're going to have what's called the development of a cleavage furrow. Uh, the cleavage furrow in the cell surface near the old metaphase plate is formed from a contractile ring of actin microfilaments associated with the motor protein myosin and it's acting like a little muscle that's going to cinch it close and pinch the cell in two cytokines in plants which have cell i'm sorry cytokinesis in plants which have cell walls involve a completely different mechanism during telophase, vesicles from the Golgi will move along microtubules to the metaphase plate. They will coalesce into a solid chunk uh, called the cell plate, which will then extend outwards until it fuses with the cell wall material, forming two new daughter cells. That does mean that plant cells will get progressively smaller over time, and eventually the surface area to volume ratio will fail. And that's where you really get sort of those, those outer woody cells. They're older and uh, they're no longer dividing. In most cases, they're dead because they're too small. Whereas animal cells without the cell wall can grow back up to size during interphase. We don't typically have that problem. How is this regulated? Well, we wanted to figure that out and we eventually realized that there were a couple of different checkpoints. They figured this out by merging cells together that were in different stages and seeing what happened. So if you take an S cell and a G1 and put them together, both cells enter S. If you take an M and a G1, both cells enter M. So basically, there must be molecules present in the cytoplasm that control the progression to these different phases. And they eventually figured out that there were three checkpoints. There was a checkpoint in G1, there was a checkpoint at the end of G2, and there was a checkpoint in the middle of mitosis. These chemical signals will drive these processes forward and we eventually figured out how they worked, but it took quite a bit of experimentation. G0 is also controlled by a checkpoint. If there is no go-ahead signal from the G1 checkpoint, the CDK cyclin, then the cell will enter the G0 phase. 
uh, the G0 phase is a non-dividing state. That's not that the cell is non-functional. It's just that it's not going to keep dividing. And most cells in the human body are, in fact, in the G0 stage. Um, highly specialized nerve and muscle cells will never divide again, whereas the liver cells can be called back. Uh, this process is controlled by the CDK cyclin, which we'll look at more in just a moment. So the cell cycle clock is basically regulated by a variety of chemicals, but the most important pair is CDK and cyclin. There's rhythmic fluctuations in the abundance and activity of cell cycle control mechanisms that will create these sort of process exchanges. One of the most important examples is what's the specific combination of CDK cyclin called MPF. Okay, so in order to drive the cell cycle forward, a cyclin must activate or inactivate target proteins inside of the cell, and cyclins are going to be driving the events of this process with kinases. They collectively form this process, with cyclins being incredibly important. The kinases are actually going to be transferring the phosphate groups, and you're going to be keeping those CDKs at a fairly constant level the cyclins will go up and down. So if the CDK is the engine doing the work, the cyclin is the key that's turning that engine on and off. There are a variety of combinations. G1S cyclins, for example, rise in late G1 and fall in early S phase. Um, so different ones are going to work together. S cyclins bind to CDK and will induce DNA replication. Um, so we see the different ones are going to be doing different things. But the... Uh, MPF is a great example of a CDK cyclin combo that is going to be moving structures forward. <clears throat> the anaphase promoting complex, or the APCC, is going to be a different type of protein that is going to be controlling the M checkpoint. So in addition to driving the events of M phase, MPF will trigger its own destruction by activating the APCC. So all of these hormones and all of these chemical signals are going to be interregulating between them. How does MPF actually work? Well, the MPF promotion mitosis is phosphorylating the proteins. So the M cyclin will combine with the CDK. That will then phosphorylate a series of proteins. So how does the nuclear membrane break down? How does the chromosome begin to condense? Where is that energy coming from? All of that is triggered by this MPF phosphorylation. They're going to add phosphate targets to these structures and everything will begin to change. It's all just simple cell signaling. It's all phosphorylation, kinase balance, but it is a cascade of things working together to make these structures function. And when they fail, that leads to many diseases and cancers. APCC is a little different. APCC is not a cyclin combo. The M phase checkpoint is ensuring that the kinetochores are properly attached and through that structure. Okay, what APCC does is it uses a different marker called ubiquitin. Ubiquitin is going to bind to the protein securin. Securin secures the enzyme separase. So it's a whole series of things. Okay, so what's actually holding the centromere together is proteins called cohesins. Okay, the enzyme separase destroys cohesins. Securin is like a security lock on separase. So when securin is marked by UB, it's destroyed. The separase becomes active, the cohesins are cut, and the chromosomes will separate, allowing anaphase to continue. So this ubiquitin tagging is something that becomes incredibly common. We do find that ubiquitin, when it is added, is going to be a marker for destruction, um, and it is an incredibly common one, which is why we called it ubiquitin, because it was ubiquitous to the cell. Other chemical control points are going on. And in the G1 checkpoint, for example, you're going to have uh, P53, which is a tumor suppressor gene. It's going to control CDK inhibitors. So if your DNA is damaged or you're not ready to move forward, the CDK inhibitor will stop the G1 process. Okay, so P53 works on multiple levels to ensure that cells do not pass on damaged DNA. First, it stops the cell cycle at G1 so that proofreading enzymes and repair mechanisms can fix the DNA damage. If the DNA damage is fixable, eventually the P53 will deactivate that process and continue G1. If the DNA damage is not fixable, P53 will then trigger uh, its final role, which is triggering the apoptosis genes.
So P53 has three jobs, to stop G1S cycling combo, to activate the proofreading enzymes to repair DNA damage, and three, if damage is not fixable, to trigger death. P53 is the most common uh, tumor suppressor gene that is mutated in cancer, so it's something that we're spending a lot of time researching. We find that there are other control mechanisms that can come from outside of the cell. These are collectively referred to as growth factors, uh, although the name is not consistent because there are many different types. What we find is that growth factors are controlling uh, two major physiological processes. Uh, so you can see an example on the left, when the growth factor is present, cells will divide quite quickly. And when growth factors run out, they will stop dividing. So we find that there is anchorage dependence. So cells require a surface for division. So if cells are not connected to a surface, they will not respond to growth factors. And that's really good for us so that we can um, heal wounds and things, but we also don't have cells dividing when they shouldn't. Density dependent inhibition is gonna be looking at space and gaps. When cells begin to push against each other, the touch sensor genes will deactivate the growth response. Okay, both of these things will need to be overcome for something like cancer to occur. Uh, anchorage dependence is going to allow cancer to spread when that turns off, whereas the density dependent when that turns off will lead to the growth of things like tumors.